guess we should go ahead. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public hearing and public meeting on Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted by remote means and has no in-person attendance is permitted. Every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by um, opening the town's homepage on an internet browser, navigate to the town calendar at the bottom of that page, click the historical commission meeting link, zoom and telephone connections uh, and meeting uh, a link to meeting materials can be found there. So now for a uh, attendance by roll call, um, Patricia Aw. Present. Robin Fordham. Present. Becky Lockwood. Here. Janet Marquart. I'm here. Hetty Startup. I'm here. And Jane Wald here too. Uh, lay at, uh, for members of the public, opportunity for public comment will be provided during uh, the public hearings uh, this evening and during a general public comment period and at other times uh, that are appropriate throughout the meeting. So first, uh, we'll begin with the public hearing in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law of Chapter 40A and Article and Article 13 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw concerning demolition delay. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interest, interested citizens to be heard regarding the following demolition application requests. Uh, first is 406 Northampton Road. Uh, this is a hearing continued from May 18th, 2022. Uh, and it's a request for the full demolition of a circa 1900 wood frame single family farmhouse. Uh, and let's see, this is a Ben, this is a continued hearing. So should we, this, we'll have this one separately from the, from the second. Correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you, okay. Um, the, the, this application and other historical information on the affected property is available at the Document Center on the town website. And again, you can find that link in the calendar uh, appointment on the town website. Let's see, so um, under, Section 13 of the town's zoning bylaw governing demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance, uh, the town has made it a matter of public policy that the economic, cultural, and aesthetic standing of the town of Amherst can best be maintained and enhanced by due regard for the historical and architectural heritage of the town by striving to discourage the use of structures of historical, uh, I'm sorry, by striving to discourage the destruction of such cultural assets. It's a protection, enhancement, perpetuation, and use of structures of historical and ar architectural significance located within the town of Amherst is a public necessity and is required in the interest of the prosperity, civic pride, and general welfare of the people. Under Massachusetts general laws and the town of Amherst zoning bylaw, the Amherst Historical Commission is responsible for enacting the purposes and procedures of this stated policy. Uh, so for this public hearing, uh, we will first um, invite the applicant to make any comments they wish to make in addition to the permit application and the supporting materials submitted with that. Um, if 
the town planning staff, Ben Brager, has any additional information, he'll be invited to um, share that. Uh, commission members may have questions for the applicant. We, there will be a point at which we'll invite public comment on this application. Um, and then uh, we will call for a motion to close the public hearing uh, for the commission members to deliberate. Um, so let's see, the um, applicants for 406 Northampton Road are, are with us. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Nice to see you. Uh, Likewise. Yeah. Um, so are there any other, any, any additional information or would you like to sort of encapsulate, summarize? Yeah, what? sure. If you don't mind. So for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of uh, whether it's the landowner or UMass Five Federal uh, Five College Federal Credit Union um, relative to 406 Northampton Road and our request to demolish that structure. Um, and so I think as was provided in the application material and as as you noted, you know this is uh, a, a property on Northampton Road in Amherst. It was a late 1800s construction. Um, it's not currently in the best state of repair. Uh, I believe that there are some issues on the interior. Um, there was a write up back in 2005 from Jonathan Tucker, the former uh, planning director. It's not on Macris. Um, and it's not necessarily part of a neighborhood. It, it might have been historically, but now it's on Route 9 to the uh, west of it is the Green Leaves driveway. To the east of it is the Zablut uh, Motors. And then a little further to the east is Hawkins Meadow. And then further to the east is One University Drive South. So it really is a commercial corridor. The bank has received their uh, Conservation Commission approval and their planning board approval for uh, a new uh, branch, a pretty fantastic branch, if, if you've seen the plans. Uh, sustainable, um, pervious pavers, pavement, uh, solar, and I know that's not necessarily within the purview of the Historical Commission, but it's always nice to know what's going to go in a place. And so you know, our suggestion is, is that, that this house, especially given the, the change of the surrounding area, is neither architecturally, um, geographically, nor historically significant. And so we would request a waiver of the demolition delay bylaw. And I'm sure Ben has some photos and maybe some additional plans if, if he'd like to show mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the car, so it's a little tough to do all that. Happy to bring, <clears throat> bring up a picture here. Um, this is the house in question at 406 Northampton Road. Oops. It's, uh, I think these were taken maybe from a car. I'm not sure, but um, shows you a bit of the context on, on Route 9 here. I think, oh, and this is the back of the go. house. Yep. I'll just go through this one more time. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Um, this, this hasn't been uh, the subject of a previous application, has it? You know, not recently. Um, you know, I know that, like I had said in our research, we had found a historical narrative from Jonathan Tucker from 2005. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there there might have been, and I think it might have been approved. And then I think what had happened was, um, I think Luke Sablit might have bought it and then turned it into a rental. Okay. And so if there was, I think it, I don't think it was ever a delay was imposed or it wasn't allowed to be demolished. I think the business circumstances changed okay. because otherwise I have never, I haven't seen Jonathan do those reports unless there was some demolition application. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Ben, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Um, no, just I can reiterate. I think there was a demolition permit issued for this property. I, I, I think I just found it now. Um, 
but yeah, it wasn't ever acted upon. Uh, that was in 2005. And then I think more recently, I forget where I read this. I think there was an emergency demolition for the garage in the back of the property as well. I think, I think that might have been part of Jonathan's narrative. Um, yeah, that was in 2005 that there was a, okay. an emergency demolition issued for that rear barn. Yeah. Uh, commission members, please, uh, if you have questions, please uh, uh, raise your hand or, or just ask. Pat? It seems to me when I read the materials um, that, that it's not on macros, and yet it falls within a category of a farmhouse and an age where if we were to agree to demolition, I would like to see that as a condition of demolition to, to note the existence of that property and that house in Amherst. Even though the site, the circumstances have changed, the house still exists and it dates back um, many decades. I don't see an issue from our perspective. I don't see an issue with documenting it. I think it's a great idea actually. Yeah, I would agree that, and I think that would be enough because it's a type of farmhouse that we do have quite a few of them in the residential streets. It's not particularly unique. Um, it's That's not saying that it's important to know these, these standard farmhouses of the time period, but I think there are others. And being on a busy street, it makes sense that this one would not be the one that was kept as opposed to say, within a neighborhood where there are others that are similar from the time period. So it doesn't bother me um, demolishing it for this new project, but I agree that it'd be nice to have it documented. So we know that on this now busy street at one time, there were these kinds of farmhouses. Uh, all right, other questions, comments from commission members? Just, just a question is, is, Tom, I'm assuming from your response that you would assist the current owner to make the macros form? To, yeah, to yes. Create yeah, it? We would, yeah. Thank you. All right, then I will um, ask for any public comment if there are um, is it, if there's anyone in the uh, watching participating that wants to make a public comment on a particular request, please um, indicate. Um, no, I seeing, see none. Seeing none. Um, uh, can I have a motion to close the public hearing? I so move. Thank you. Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All in favor? We can, we can do a hand raise, I think. Thank you. Um, unanimous. Um, so the public hearing has been closed and we move to deliberating uh, the, the general criteria. So we know that the building is not uh, a significant structure according to um, the, the, I'm sorry, that the building is not listed uh, uh, as um, individually or as part of a registered district. So that one is settled. Um, then uh, there are the three categories of historical importance. Uh, and there are, sub -cat there are subheadings uh, beyond that. But first, let me ask if any member of the commission uh, finds or wishes to discuss any of the subheads under historical importance. Shane, I think the only one that would apply would be some sort of architectural significance in that it's typical of a modest farmhouse from the time period. Um, and we can say yes on that and still approve the demolition. 
I don't think any of the other things in terms of an architect or events or people who live there or anything like that would apply. So that would be the only one I could see. Even streetscape it doesn't fit the streetscape anymore. So. Okay. Okay. So nothing in historical importance. Uh, Jan has indicated uh, architectural importance as being typical of a period. Anything? Any, does anyone want to raise anything about geographic importance? Okay, so then um, I think we can move to a vote on the demolition permit request. So finding, finding, finding it not significant, sounds like. Yeah, should we okay. make a motion? Yes, make a motion. Uh, I move that we allow demolition of 406 Northampton Road based upon um, no, not this um, <laughs> uh, Let me, let me, <laughs> I, might, I might have rushed that. Um, ben, are you saying that we should vote first on whether it's significant or not? <clears throat> oh, right. I forgot there's two steps now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I erase that. I move yeah. that the commission does not find, well, we find it to be architecturally significant for its um, typical circa 1900 farmhouse style. And that's the only one, right? Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Um, so we will just uh, take this as a roll call. Um, Patricia off. What is the question, Jane? I'm oh, sorry. are you uh, doing the motion? We're, uh, we're so doing the the motion, motion. motion has been made and seconded. Um, I think and, and I, we'll take a roll call vote for uh, for the finding of significance. Yes. So your vote is. My my vote is that that we found it significant as a typical farmhouse. Okay. But but not a significant structure. Okay. Um, Robin. Uh, yeah, um, in favor of the motion. Jan? Yes. Hetty? Okay. Hetty? Yes, I'm in favor of the motion. Okay, and um, I will... Don't forget Becky. Oh, Becky? I'm sorry. Yes. I'm in favor of the motion. Okay. <laughs> All right, then um, I'll vote yes also. So there is this binding of significance that it's a building typical of a period and style and social economic mm -hmm. persons. Um, and now, uh, now we, now there's a motion for allowing the demolition permit request or imposing a demolition delay. So, um, I'll just go ahead and move that we, uh, that we allow the demolition, that we approve the demolition permit request. Second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? Then let's uh, once again do a roll, roll call vote and we'll start at the other end this time and I will say yes. And then Hetty? I will say yes too, Jane. Thank you. Jan? Yes. Robin? Muted. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Pat? Yes. Becky? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for, for coming tonight. Of course. Good seeing you all. So long. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ben. Great job. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So um, we go to the next request for 80 Pine Street. Um, let's see. So this is, again, in a 
accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 13 of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding an a, a demolition permit request for 80 Street um, parcel 5A86, uh, which asks for complete removal of a circa 1960 one and a half story detached barn carriage house and removal and reconstruction of a single story rear section of the circa 1860 wood frame duplex. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, uh, I had sent this out in an email yesterday, but I just wanted to remind folks that there was this issue that was uh, raised to me where the, uh, the applicant, um, or the commission has 35 days to hold the public hearing um, after the application is submitted. Um, and this hearing is being held, I think, 42 days after the application was submitted. Um, and so the applicant uh, is aware of this um, and pointed it out. And so in normal circumstances, the uh, basically our, our hands would be kind of tied. We would uh, either waive the public hearing or just, you know, have the hearing, but it would be, uh, the, the permit would be issued regardless, but um, because it's, uh, you know, if it if it's beyond that thirty five day window, then the um, permit can be issued. Uh, this uh, case is a little bit unique in that the applicant's also seeking a special permit from the zoning board of appeals um, for the project, and so there's the the spe in a special permit, um, the ZBA has quite a bit of leeway in, in terms of putting conditions on a project. Um, you know they have to have like certain findings and, and make make a case for different conditions but um the historical commission i think we have a chance to if you want to entertain the idea of like making a recommendation to the zba um and so this is technically i think uh it's not a public hearing i think we would have this be like a public meeting we can still invite public comment certainly but um, it, rather than an Article 13 public hearing, it's, it's more just an a opportunity to discuss whether to make recommendations to the ZBA or not. What's um, the zoning um, question they're bringing to the board? So they are, um, it's a non-owner occupied duplex. And so they are expanding the footprint or they're, they're adding square footage yeah. to the house. And so they, a special permit's required for that. Okay. Um, and it has to be more units, not just a bigger house, right? Or what it looks like. I don't think it's, I, I think they're just expanding that back unit. I think it's still gonna be a two unit house. Um, oh, okay. It's hard to tell. With, it looks like it's gonna be four bedrooms per unit though. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, I, I um, apologize about the oversight with the scheduling. I think, uh, you know, last in the May meeting, we had like, what, like six demolition hearings. And this one came in like a week before that meeting and and I think I was just so busy getting prepared for the May meeting that I didn't even notice when it kind of popped into my inbox and then um I just assumed this hearing was being held within 35 days of it but yeah I guess I lost track of that a little bit so and we couldn't I couldn't open the actual photographs I could only look at the plan because of their um oh okay because of the tag on them and they downloaded, but they wouldn't open. So could you show us a couple of the current conditions? Yeah. So this is what the applicant sent me. I'll, I'll zoom in, um, I think, yeah. So it's basically, this is the back of the house. 
um, the, the street is on the other side. So they're proposing to take down this back part of the house and then build a new like two story structure on the back. Okay. So from the front, it's not gonna look that different. Yeah, I don't, I, it, except for like a, a few, yeah, except from a very sharp angle, you can't actually really see this back right section Looked i'm like sorry they were matching the roof line and everything so. yeah hold on um and then this is the barn the uh -huh. 1960s barn in the back that's also you can't see this from the road mm -hmm. um and yeah. it also it's weird it doesn't have a foundation it kind of just hangs over this hillside that's not our best example of a barn yeah i have no concerns about the permit for the barn. Yeah, and it's kind of a similar, I, I, put in, I put in an email that the applicant sent to me. It's a similar situation as the one on Stanley Street where it's a barn in a non-owner occupied rental. And basically from the moment this property manager uh, took over this property, he boarded up the barn and you know doesn't want anyone near it. It's a, it's a liability. Um, and so it's basically just, it's, I think he said there's a holes in the ground, in the floor. So it's like, you can't really even walk in it. Um, so I don't have any problem with either piece coming down. I don't think yeah. this is a very attractive addition that was put on. And I think the new one from the drawings looks like it'll match the style and look better. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I did, I did do a drive by today and the, the, the barn clearly is, is, disposable and I agree with Jan the this addition was not very thoughtful in terms of, of consistency mm -hmm. with the age and style of the, the house but the house itself looks like it needs care mm -hmm. so I hope I hope that when they they do this addition they attend to the whole of the whole of it it's a rental yeah is there any kind of recommendation we want to make to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It, it, and from, I guess from our standpoint, it would be, you know, his, historic, it, I, it, I think it would still be a question of historical significance that we, that we would comment on. But Maybe we just want to tell the Zoning Board we'd like them to be encouraged to up, to keep up the original house. So it doesn't deteriorate, even though it's a rental. And and that the addition should be more consistent with the style of the original house. It is. I mean, if you look at the plans, it definitely is. Right, does. right. But to reinforce that notion. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, do we need to vote on that, Ben, or is our, is our what appears to be a consensus, is that sufficient? Yeah, no, I think um, I think that's fine. It's not a Article Thirteen matter. It's just a I can transmit this discussion to the ZBA. They're actually meeting tomorrow, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, did I actually? I don't think I actually opened a hearing on this, did I? So we don't need to close. No. It. Okay. Great. Um, so next is uh, reviewing and approving minutes of three meetings, if we've had a chance to look at those. I just have one comment on the May meeting under discussion of one of the Stanley Street properties. Yeah. Um, it shows that I made a motion and that I also seconded my motion. Oh. <laughs> So I don't think that can happen that way. So maybe just to change it to the motion was seconded. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, Off made a motion. Yeah, okay, I see. It. No, wait, where is that? Um, okay, I'll make a note of that and then make that change. Uh, I move we accept all three meeting minutes. I second. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Just a show of hands. Aye. Uh, okay, unanimous. Thank you. Um, 
let's see. We have a couple of things that that are more, I think, discussions. One is discussion of preservation plan goals. Shannon Walsh was not able to be here with us this evening, so but we probably should take a few minutes to think about uh, the preservation planning process coming up. And the other is um, using CPA funds for private properties and how that concept can be developed and advocated for in Amherst. So um, preservation plan, I think you saw from Ben's email, to, was it today or yesterday? Today? Just today, yeah. Um, that Shannon recommends that we think about and we can discuss as, as much as we feel we can hold this discussion uh, about what the commission's main goals and expectations are for the updated preservation plan. Um, we could discuss how the role of the commission has changed in the last 17 years. Um, what main concerns do the, does the commission currently have related to historic preservation in Amherst? And is there anything else to, to, um, to add? Um, and I didn't have a chance to look at any of those links of other people's plans because yeah. I've been foggy on pain meds, um, but I would like to look at them and see if they shed any light on what we are not doing and what ours doesn't have, mm -hmm. you know, to have a sense. I mean, I don't honestly know how much we've changed since 2005 because none of us have been on it. You know, we're on it. Though. I mean, Jim would be the one to ask, right? Wasn't he chair back then? Mm -hmm. um, so I, it's hard to answer any of those questions, but maybe looking at the others we can for next meeting. I don't know. Well, I, I have a, couple of comments on them. I don't know if this will, uh, just observation about the 2005 preservation plan. Um, that didn't, uh, you know, I did a search for the word goal or goals. And what I came across in that preservation plan was not the commission's goals and not really historic preservation goals, but rather what are the community goals? Uh -huh. um, and I think that was the time uh, just, I think just after that, that the town adopt, that the town conducted a, a, a big master plan process and into the master plan there was a section in the master plan concerning historic preservation goals. So it, it could be interesting in reviewing the 2005 preservation plan to also take a look at the uh, that piece of the master plan because I, there uh -huh. was a whole lot in there about you know things like village centers and you know all kinds of stuff like that. So that's just a just a thought I had when I. Uh, when I read the thing about goals and I couldn't actually identify them in the, uh, in, in the preservation plan. Um, I'll bet that the role of the commission has evolved or is at least different. Um, right. And then we, we may well have some main concerns, I mean, as a commission about uh, about historic preservation in Amherst right at this right at this moment, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll bet I'll bet there's going to be plenty of opportunity to talk about that. But if there's anything you want to sort of get out on the table tonight, uh, we could take a minute for that. Can I go where angels fear to tread? That <laughs> seems like that's where you're headed, Hetty. So keep going. Okay, so um, you know it, it it occurs to me that there's there's been a lot of building in Amherst in the five years almost that I've been here. Um, I think in past meetings this year, we've identified that there isn't um, a lot of shared understanding of what historic preservation is, particularly in relation to things like streetscape 
or the idea that our town has this sort of historic quality to it, which is incredibly valuable and one reason that people move here. Um, and I know that it was up to me to kind of put together some things to write about with the Amherst Indy possibly, and, and I am pursuing that and talking with Art Keen about that and with other members of um, the community too. Um, I also think that it just distresses me that we're um, allowing things to be demolished, but with perfectly appropriate decision-making tools and arriving at consensus because we have a housing crisis. And I think trying to do, trying to do the work of the commission is feeling very hard, you know, in relation to that. For me personally, um, and you know, I, I guess I'm just hoping that we also will ride through um, a change in leadership of the commission itself. Um, when I hear Jane introduce an item, I think to myself, I need to um, almost be like her shadow and and sort of model the the way things are introduced and discussed and, and, you know, and so that I have a better sense of that as if I was writing the minutes or helping to lead discussion or whatever it is. And, and with six members of the commission, it, it's just feeling really thin to me, not that we aren't all wonderful, <laughs> but we are, you know, I, I, when I thought that I was going to be late tonight, I thought, oh God, I really can't be late. I don't, I mean, I, I want to make sure we have a quorum. And I, so I'm being very upfront and candid here, but those are my concerns. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I think um, six months or so ago, I don't remember exactly when our commission shared a concern about the um, historic homes on North Pleasant Street that have become retail at the street level and built out a little bit. And, Hetty and I volunteer to work with the local historic district, the Sunset South Whitney Lincoln Avenue. And um, I, I pulled macros forms for all of those buildings, et cetera, and passed them on. And they took it over to, to do other, you know, identify other homes. But I think, I, I guess part of my thought is that we need to have somewhat of an advocacy role um, as, as part of our goals to, um, advocate for the preservation of buildings that have been identified as historic before it happens that they just get demolished and any 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 architecture of any kind goes in place of them. You know, there are some towns that have rules and uh, regulations, whatever um, traditions of new uh, development has to mirror the uh, style of the the founding founding architecture, and so, I, you know, this this is stuff. This just mulls around in my head as to as a Amherst Historical Commission member, what can we do to actively um, try to preserve what's in danger? You know, not not that a demolition request just come in, but that's in danger. Um, and so I, 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 it's a slippery slope, and I don't know exactly how we would do that, except uh, as Hetty and I did, and um, you know, to step up to work with the local historic district and act, help activate them, which they are doing now. Although I think there's some members in the local district who, whose idea of preservation is maybe different than we assume. So anyway, just my thoughts. That's actually, that's one of the, big changes that can be included in the change to the historical commission is now there are two local historic districts that didn't exist in 2005 and this whole other body of a local historic district commission. So that's a big change. Mm -hmm. um, one thing back probably somewhere around the time of the preservation plan and master plan, maybe a little after that, there was a big to do in Amherst about form-based zoning, which mm -hmm. could address the 
the concern about new construction and how it integrates into historic streetscapes. And I don't know if that would ever, Ben, have you heard any whispers about that returning? I thought it was kind of a good idea, but um, it, it, it went down in a ignominious defeat in town meeting. And of course that's mm -hmm. another change. So um, uh, yeah. Um, let's see, Robin, then Jan. Um, so I've been working this summer uh, with the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission on a survey of historical commissions in Berkshire County. And the thinking that I've had in my brain for the last couple of months is that um, it's really hard for the commission itself to be an advocate that our, that our role starts with planning. So it starts with things like having an effective demolition delay bylaw in place, understanding how to impose a delay in a way that allows for some negotiation of conditions, which aren't binding, but still gives the commission more power um, and getting, you know, that the, one of the responsibilities of commissions is making sure inventories are up to date. And I think my frustration has been, um, you know, I would echo Pat's comments around advocacy, but I'm also starting to understand. And um, again, in this work that I'm doing, and I'm working with Chris Skelly, that one of the big recommendations is to have an advocacy organization that's outside your commission, that, mm -hmm. that is, a, a friends of Amherst Preservation or, or something like that, that allows for that, um, that kind of promotion of, of you know, French demolition resources that are outside of, um, you know, that may fall outside of what the, 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 the legal and um, you know, legislative powers of the commission are. So the sort of the more the persuasion and and connection arm of things. Um, so I think I just wanted to make that comment and later when we come to um, unanticipated items that'll relate to some of my thoughts about how we could uh, move as a commission to move forward a barn preservation program that would exist in both places. And, and um, because I think it's really challenging for us as a commission to both fulfill our kind of legislative duty or administrative duty and also be um, advocates outside of those parameters. There's, there's not a lot of time for it and our, our, our main responsibilities and our, our official roles as commissioners. So that's, that's just my, my comment there. Thanks Robin. Jan, do you want? Um, I would just echo some of that and say that I think what it comes down to is we can only do so much, but in terms of any advocacy that might be within our purview, the main thrust I think has to be against neglect. Um, because we have so much definition by neglect. And that's a matter of just raising awareness, right? So if we could do a better job of letting the town know what we're doing, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. I think that would be a, a baseline advocacy, which then could be much more developed by another group. But we can't fight neglect if people don't know that we exist and what we're trying to stop from happening. Um, so, you know, there's just different kinds of concerns and the main, our main, point purpose is this whole demolition delay issue to grant or not grant that permit but it but it hinges on the notion of neglect because it's just too easy for people to automatically get it by ignoring the building until it's falling down so that's why i think we should have more coverage um, i think what hetty started to do is a wonderful first step we start highlighting specific types of buildings in individual buildings whatever in media, but also maybe um, we need some other ways of getting the word out about our successes. 
you know, things like the writer's walk. I mean, I know that's not typical because CPA funds probably aren't going to pay for something like that again, but just the things we do do, it would be nice if it were uh, more common knowledge so that people could feel proud of their house, their street, their neighborhood, their barn, whatever. Okay, thank you, Jan. So these are good. These are all good. I've okay. written a list of the things that I'm mulling over and um, I'm in touch with Art about what sounds interesting to him as someone commenting generally on what's going on in Amherst. I'm happy to share that um, with the rest of the commission. Um, it's going slowly and I, I wanted, I, I should just say, I wanted to start with a piece about Candida Musante and her husband, John, Peanut John, who are represented in the new version of Amherst's history mural, but I can't find the, the little hook that I really want, which is that they are related to John Musante of town manager, first town manager fame and the health center. So I'm a little bit stuck, <clears throat> but I can, I'll send this list around. In fact, but I can't put it in the chat because we don't mm -hmm. have that, but I'll send it to Ben. That's what I'll do. Yeah, no, there's also a Musanti Beach in, in Northampton. So I think it's really a, oh. yeah, might be like a, a, a regional name. The, 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 the Candida is related to the people in, in Northampton. Okay. Which just makes me very cautious about jumping onto something that I really yeah. want to have be more significant than it actually turns out to be in reality. So yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit... Um, leery about that but I'll, I'll send you the list Ben we can share okay. it all I would say to that is Patty don't get hung up on mm, hooks if you have something that needs to be said about a building or a neighborhood you know it's fun to find a research focus but if it doesn't quite fit with what you're trying to do for us then okay. I would just drop it and keep going because you can end up like you said completely stuck and then nothing happens wow Jan, Jan that was that was really great professorial <laughs> Sorry, I go through this. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm just, I'm teasing you. It's great. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> Enough. Well, you know, you've given this advice yourself, I'm sure. <laughs> Good discussion. Thank you very much. Um, and um, we may be talked out on that this evening. Is that, you think? Okay. So yeah. let's go to um, the next agenda item, use of CPA funds for private properties. And I think Robin, you have, uh, you have a case study, for example, that you want to bring. Is this on the agenda? I don't see it. It was on the, um, I think it wasn't um, in your email agenda. This, I got mine off the website. Yeah, I don't. We can uh, cover that under unanticipated items, I guess. I okay. think, I guess it didn't make the cut for what I put on the PDF, sorry. Okay. Um, but yeah, why don't we talk about that uh, shortly? Because I actually do, I've been contacted by a few different organizations interested in CPA funds. So I feel like I want to I wanna bring that to everyone's attention. Um, the next thing on the agenda I see here is uh, just about the preservation bylaw. Um, and just briefly touching on next steps with that. I don't see that on the agenda. Okay, here, I'll, I'll share share what I have here. I have a different agenda. Than we yeah. Do. yeah. I don't, I haven't been getting, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. If I don't, um, I try to send it out, but if I don't, it's always um, on the commission's website under agendas. Well, can I just say, yippee, <laughs> the bylaw went through. I mean, it's kind of yeah anticlimactic now, but geez, that was seven years of work. That was a lot of work, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was only here for obviously the last what, like two ish years of it, but uh, it was it was it was a quit the hall to 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 get it over the finish line. And thank you all for uh, being patient and sharing your input and making it a great document and 
now we get to actually implement it and see how it works. So, um, but the, uh, the point I wanted to raise was, well, I guess twofold. One is, um, I think it ultimately did pass unanimously, but uh, there was a few town council members who expressed um, significant concerns over the, uh, the designee idea and having um having well, I guess, and they were they're actually approaching it from different perspectives one was pro approaching it from neighbors and abutters and saying how would how would community members have a way to be involved in the decision if it's being made just by a single person outside of a public meeting and how could they appeal a decision how could they make their voices heard so um that was one per one per uh council member was raising that point and then another council member was saying kind of the op opposite perspective from from a developer's perspective um you know how do they make a case uh for uh, a building either being significant or not significant if it's you know, you know just being made by a designee or and how can they appeal that decision so in the end um obviously the bylaw passed and um these two council members, um, you know, we, we agreed that we would uh, continue talking with them and try to, you know, there, there may be things we can do kind of in the rules and regulations of the bylaw to address some of their concerns. Um, and so we're going to meet with them in July. Um, there's not a huge rush, you know, because they're all, they also agree we can kind of see how the bylaw plays out over time and then make tweaks. But uh, so that's, um, I just want to let people know that, um, and Jane, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, so the concern about the designee, are, are, is the point of the two-step process being, not being recognized in that discussion? All right, and then, yeah, so Chris, Rob, and I were at the meeting and we explained that, you know, the, the a very important part of this change is to is to one you know streamline decisions and make it so that there, there's a quick decision made for buildings that are not significant but the ones that are significant go to the public hearing and the public hearing focuses on uh you know whether to place the delay or not um and so i think that was understood and and obviously it's it's counter into it. it would slow down the process to have an appeals process or to open it up to the um you know the public meeting so yeah i think that that was recognized uh as kind of a, the balance that we were trying to have so if push came to shove i i don't think there's any point in having an appeals process at the first stage yeah whether it's significant or not. It could be if, you know, if, it, if a, uh, shoot, now I'm forgetting what we're calling it, a permit, a- Oh, demolition authorization? That's it, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at that stage, maybe, but if, if, if under this structure, if there's an appeals process at two steps, that's that's yeah. taking, that's taking one step forward and maybe four or five steps. Back. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so I, there was a few other um, considerations. One is that uh, I we also added this clause in the administrative function in the administrative section of the bylaw where the the designee can be um, can be authorized or the designee can be designated, I guess that's the word, but depending on the application type. So it doesn't have to be like, all right, for like, for the next few months, it's gonna be Jan, or for the next few months, it's gonna be Ben. It can be like for, you know, um, outbuildings that are 80 year, you know, between 75 and 100 years old, it's, you know, it can be X person, but for, you know, 
primary structures that are over 100 years old, it, it should be a subcommittee or it could be the full commission even. So we could, uh, we there is some wiggle room in terms of like, uh, you know, maybe for mid-century garages, it's it's one person can make the decision, but for uh, older primary structures, maybe there's more consideration given. So we, we have that flexibility if, and we don't have to use it, but um, there is that option to split it up by application type, so. Uh, Jan? Um, I'm just wondering if there's a way for an easy publication of, of the subjects that are gonna come up so that abutters and developers and whoever know that this is going to be considered by the designee and the staff, right? And they could just then let us know if they had an iron in the fire. You know, mm -hmm. if utter says, I want you to know that this is a concern to three people in the neighborhood or whatever. Um, and then we would either automatically pass it on to a public meeting, or we would just take that into consideration when we come to the, deliber the initial deliberation. How do they find out right now? And it, can we make it easier for everyone to know you know, that an application is coming up for initial discussion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so right now, the way people find out is because everything goes to a public hearing, um, we we mail letters to every neighbor within or a butter within 300 feet of the property. Um, mm -hmm. We also post a legal ad. Uh, right, post that's for the meet the public meeting. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering at how a, an easier way for the initial. You know, yeah, I mean. We, we, Rob and I were talking about like we could have like a, a just a place on the historical commission's website where we say, you know, this project is under review. Um, you know, but then some, someone would have to know to, to check the website. Um, what about in that? What's that thing that goes out regularly from the town office to let us know things that are happening? You know, the July 4th fireworks date, the, you know, mm -hmm. vaccinations available, the road work on Southeast and that kind of stuff, you know, those come through all the time. Mm -hmm. Could every time one of these applications was going to be considered, could that just be one of those little bl email blasts or is that too much? Um, we could set up a separate email blast, maybe just for like, if people want to subscribe to like historical preservation yeah, or by or district. Something. Maybe it yeah. would only go out to like District One or District Five, whatever it's in. It's yeah. a way of making it simpler. I don't know. Yeah, but having people subscribe—that's a smart idea because we do now have that, don't we? Subscriptions for different kinds of yeah classes. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought if people knew, they could let us know. Then we could deal with it up front, and then maybe it wouldn't cause so much congestion down the road at a public hearing. Jane, what do you think? I think that it's a good idea to give people a way to opt in um, in the in the absence of you know multi-stage outreach. I wouldn't want I wouldn't necessarily want you, Ben, to all of a sudden have to manage an email list, but would it, right. it so how, how, how does that work? Is there, is there communication staff that manages all of that so that we don't have to have a separate email? We can just pop something into the queue that goes Well, away. yeah, I just, I don't, I don't think, you know, I'm sure there's, what are there, 40,000 people in Amherst? I'm sure there's maybe like 10,000 people getting the, uh, you know, emerge or I don't know what it is like emergency notifications or you know in the news notifications. I don't think we would necessarily want to use that to notify every um, time a you know garage or barn or something is up for demolition. I, I, I that's why I was a leaning towards maybe there would be a new uh, subscription email email listserv. I guess it would be. And I mean, I, I think it's pretty automated on the website. Like if we made, we would just make the category and then people would add their email to that. Right. And that, and then the only, I mean, the added work for me would just be to, uh, 
you know, actually prepare and send the emails each time. But. but it would essentially, wouldn't it essentially add up to like the same permit request statement, you know, the address and what they want to do, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. or what they want to do. It could be pretty formulaic. Could, yeah. 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 Okay. Maybe it could save you having to do those mailings to the abutters and everything. Maybe this could be in lieu of that. Um, unfortunately, yeah, it's, 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 it's written in the bylaw for all for the, the public hearing process. Yeah, the public hearing that. requires notifications. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, wow. so much for that idea. Well, maybe is it Brianna that would work on this, or who would? Who um. Would over? Yeah, I think it, it it could be pretty quick to set up the email uh, notifications. Um. But yeah, it would be Brianna working on that. So. I'm just going to piggyback on this. My hand is up. Um, before before this discussion about email notifications, I I wondered in terms of the the um, planning board, the planning department gets requests for demolition, and I don't know whether it's a violation of privacy or not, but it would seem to me that the request for demolition becomes a public document, and whether or not whenever one comes through. There'd just be a rolling list from the zoning department. On and, the website, yeah. Yeah, a, a website, you know, and, and let the town know that anyone who's interested in who's in demolition, they can go to this, this function on the zoning uh, department. Um, and, and maybe we'd want to separate it out by those buildings or structures that are over 75 years old, because that's what our preservation law, law says now, um, and then a section of everything before that, but but it wouldn't have to be disseminated. You know, it, if if people are told that they can find it there, if they're interested enough, they'll you know there are people in this town who are interested to go online every day and check it out. Um, so anyway, that was my thought because it seems like it would minimize minimize a, a lot of of. Uh, Layers. Yeah, that's, it's available, it's public. Right. But you need, you know, the, you need to take the step yourself. Right, so. right. But, but the town in, in, in dissemination of information, this newsletter you're talking about could say, uh, as of, July 1st, every request for demolition will be posted by the planning department. Um, and those that are 75 years or older will be separate from all the rest. And so then people have to take the initiative if they're, if they're wanting to know. But if it comes to hearing, then Ben, you still have to do the same process as sending a butters, because that's the law. Um, but but otherwise, you know, it it's it's a question of when a, an application comes into the zoning department, they have a, a a mechanism, a program that just shifts it to this list and sorts it seventy five years or older or not. If it isn't seventy five years or older, it doesn't come. Doesn't matter. The, yeah. It doesn't come to us. It has nothing to do with the demolition delay bylaw. So right, and so relevant. so. You know, if they put all of them up, then that's public information for everybody. Mm -hmm. But if they sort out the 75 years or older, because that has the potential to come to us, um, they they could have a program where they just move the application to this list, maybe the 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 address only, and then a link to look at the application. But I think I think a program I could be you're, developed. You're, unless you're crazy, you're not going to be looking every day to see is my name. They were about to try to demolish something on their property. I mean, what are you going to do? Check every day just in case something on your. Well, street? if you're that worried about it, you will. Yeah, but then we'll only get the nuts I was at the public hearing, you know? <laughs> Normal people who would have regular concerns aren't the ones who are checking that list. Well, it's <laughs> so, just it's just one way of doing it that that's efficient yeah, I mean, yeah. and not labor intensive. Yeah. Definitely is less labor intensive. Yeah. Like it's practical, but it's definitely less labor intensive. Yeah, I mean the thing anyway. is is uh um 
obviously if it's found to be significant it'll go to a public hearing and uh, you know everyone in the neighborhood will know it's really if and this is what the point chris uh, my boss made at the public hearing is if if this designee is doing a bad job and keeps finding what should be significant structures insignificant you know i think the historical commission will hold this designee accountable um because and and i at the very least i think there will be a reporting system so that you all know as the historical commission like wow you know these uh you know 18 hundreds barns keep getting demolished and they don't even get to our get to us or something and eventually you're going to say either well designee you're 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 out someone else has got to do it or you're going to say well maybe it should be a subcommittee or maybe you know the full commission should be doing it so that's kind of, that's another point we made which is like you know there could always be ones that slip through the cracks but um the commission is empowering someone to make this decision on their behalf and if they're not doing a good job, they will find out and pick someone else or do things differently. So, um, you know, yeah, that's a good point, Ben. And maybe under procedures or maybe yeah. procedures, um, a list the, a, a list of um, permit requests that the designee has acted upon mm -hmm. should be included in a meeting packet. Uh, not for discussion unless something looks awry, but just for information. Yeah. yeah. So that there's some com commission oversight to to help. Yeah. Because I do. I do. I do. For when you put them in front of the firing line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do something similar for the local historic district because um, there's projects that come before me that I I make a decision that are not. That are that are excluded from review because they're out of view from the public way, or it's you know one of the many exclusions in the bylaw, and so I, I report those to the commission every so often just to you know let them know that there are things happening. They just always, don't always get to the mm -hmm. hearing stage. So, yeah. okay. um, but but um, yeah, I guess all this is to say is the uh, the bylaw becomes effective. Um, on Tuesday, so June twenty eighth. Um, so if um, I wasn't expecting us to make a decision on the designee or, or the process tonight, um, I would. I was just going to say maybe we can, you know, think about that today, and um, you know, make maybe make a decision later in the summer. But uh, for the time being. Um, uh, it's almost going to be like business like usual. I mean, the, the applications will come to the commission to make a decision about um, significance and then uh, hold the public hearing. So, um, but once we get the designee process up and running, we can, that'll be the two-step process will take shape. We could make a designee now. I mean, what's to stop us? Unless we're expecting new members next week. Right? No, 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 we're not expecting new members. I don't know. Week. I mean, it just seems to be easier for you if we just go ahead and start it as of Tuesday. I don't know. Why well, kick the can down the road, right? Yeah, it's up, it's up to you all. Um, I don't see uh, issues either way. It would just streamline it for you, right? Mm -hmm. We could right away start not bothering with things that don't need hearings. Mm -hmm. Save you a lot of trouble. I don't like Anybody want to be the designee? After, after seven years getting this ready, now we're going, we're going to, to instantly, <laughs> instantly implement it. Uh, so I, well, I, after seven years. <laughs> <laughs> so Jan makes a good point. Why well, kick the can down the road? Are there any, which is a pro for choosing a designee? Any cons that anyone can think of? Becky. I have a question. Like the designee is going to come from one of us, right? Okay. So then what does it mean that the designee is going to be 
or, or what or Ben? Okay. Well, and thought, and thought, or Ben? Yeah. I thought Ben was the rep from the planning department. So it was this whole thing where it's um, if it's me, if there's two designees, if it's me and a commission member, it becomes a subcommittee, and we would need to hold the um, these as public meetings to make the determination. So it's the building commissioner and a designee. Who, who's the second person? It's it's the planning department, the planning commissioner. Who's I, we, it's two people that are making this decision in the bylaw. I thought it was you and one of us. Is it the building commissioner and one of us? No, it's it's one person. If we yeah, want it, it's one person. Um, oh, that was the issue. Okay, I remember. Yeah, if it's okay. if it's if it's two people, it's uh, it's a subcommittee. Um, which isn't the end of the world. It would just be a 48 hours notice to hold a it's complicated. really short Zoom meeting. Um, but uh, the other thing was it can be one person and you all can encourage that person to discuss with like the chair of the commission or, or another member, but it, it, the, the power is vested in that one person to actually make the decision. So that's kind of a, a way to, yeah. Do you want to do it then? I mean, or would you rather avoid it? Because if you want to do it, then we can just set it up that you would discuss it with the chair. Right, yeah. Um, I I don't mind I don't the mind. responsibility. I, the way I see it, the applications are coming into me anyway. And then if, if someone else was designated, I would, I, would, I guess, just send them everything anyway. Um, so it, you know, it takes one step out of the process. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't mind it. I, I had kind of prepared that it, it would be a staff person. Um, so, but I, I also think there's some merit in having it be a commission member as well, but. Well, can so, I move that Ben be our designee and that he consult with the chair and we see how it goes. And if we want to fire him <laughs> later, we can. <laughs> I won't so take it personally. <laughs> be on your best behavior, buddy. <laughs> Sarah, so that sounds like a formal motion. Is there a second, Hetty? Okay, thank you. Uh, further discussion? I, yeah, I guess I would just, I guess this is, yeah, this is more of it. So just, I guess it make it clear that, you know, as of, as of Tuesday, June 28th, when the general bylaw preservation for the historically significant structures becomes effective. Uh, and that, yeah, and then I guess I, you were designating me to make the determination of significance per section. I don't have it up right now, but. I, I have such faith that you will write yeah. this motion properly. I'm leaving okay. it in capable hands. Okay. Now this has, Nothing to do with you, Ben, but uh, I, some comments that I heard at the first, well, first hearing and maybe some other hearing um, expressed concern about town staff being the, being the designee, being the designer. Mm. So I just want to, you know, just raise that as uh, just, so you know that that was um, that concern was articulated more than once in the process of of having this bylaw passed. So, uh, Jane, don't you think there'd also be issues though with one of us because you know they maybe think we weren't qualified, yada yada yada. Whereas if we say very clearly in the motion that it's him in consultation with the chair, it kind of acts as a okay, you know, yeah. So also. yeah. Yeah, Jan, your point that, yes, that concern was also articulated. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so is that, according to the bylaw or the sentiments that you've heard, Ben, is that language acceptable in consultation with? So it's not. It's so yeah, I think maybe you say like in encouraging consultation with the chair. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so let's amend the motion to include that phrase. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Um, so I think we've gotten to the further discussion. Is there any further, further discussion? Then let us, uh, let's take a vote. Um, uh, those in favor, just signify by saying aye or yes or in favor. Aye. Right. Um, so let's, we'll, we'll just go through the, the roll call just for formality's sake. Um, Robin Fordham. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Patty Starta. Okay. Um, Jan Marquardt. Aye, aye. Becky aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> um, I'm in favor. Okay, and Pat, oh. In favor. Okay, and Jane Wald, I'm in favor. Congratulations, yeah. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> You can add designee to your title. Yeah, exactly. I'll put that in my email signature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I think maybe in, in July, I might need you guys to make an alternate designee for when I go on vacation for two weeks in August. But <laughs> sure. other, other than that, no, I think, um, well, thank you for trusting me. And uh, yeah, I don't have any pending applications, but matter of days, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have two selections, elections plus unanticipated items. Jones Library Project update. No, it's number three. You're not looking at the same. I'm not. I don't have that agenda. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jones Library update. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Jane, I wasn't sure if you had anything you wanted to add for this. Um, I'm, excuse me, just a moment. I'm looking at two computers. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I have a, a communication from a uh, one of the library trustees who wants to keep the Historical Commission apprised of what's happening with the Jones Library design process and community outreach. Um, so I will forward that email to, uh, to Ben who can distribute it to all of you. Okay. Okay. And if I, if I can find it before we're done. Okay. <laughs> Okay. My, uh, I think that's not gonna, that's not gonna work for us today. So I'll send okay. it to you, we'll distribute it. To yeah, home. no rush, that All sounds right. good. Um, here, I'll bring up the agenda just so we can, I'll be looking at the same thing. Um, Okay. Let's see. Oh, the next one's a big one. So I also include vice chair and design review board rep, right? And CPA rep. And CPA. And does that need to be renewed at this point? I was wondering what the schedule on that was. Yeah. So we basically need four positions filled with the remaining four people. No. So first, uh, first, a uh, procedural question. So the advertised agenda, yeah, didn't have design review board on it. Um, do we need to hold off on that? Um, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, aware that we needed a new DRB rep at this stage. Oh. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that makes sense. We've needed yeah. it for, since she left. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I would rather hold off on that until next meeting, just because I, yeah, it wasn't advertised. Okay. Um, I think we can do chair and vice chair, um, and then maybe do DRB and CPA rep for next meeting. 
Okay. Does CPA meet between now and the next meeting? Um, I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. We had a um a penciled in date of June 9th. If oh. our business on June 2nd didn't get finished and we finished our business. So I don't think there are any more until the fall. All right. So for um, new commission chair, I'll maybe do this in a slightly unconventional way. And one is for anyone who has an active interest and inclination, it's perfectly fine for you to nominate yourself. And so I guess I'll just open the floor for nominations. Mm -hmm. And you can nominate others, obviously. Robin Fordham has her hand up. I'm gonna nominate Jan to take over for the time being. <laughs> you know, it would only be for six months. Right. And you know, I don't wanna do it, but we've already talked about it. <laughs> She browbeat me last night. <laughs> um, on, here's the condition. Robin would be vice chair. I would agree with that. Um, is there a second to the nomination? Eddie, second? For nominations, folks. Nominate other people. And so does the nominee accept the nomination? Not the position, but the nomination. What, me and Robin, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is, Wait, we're, we're not Robin. running on a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> we're making it conditional here. No. <laughs> Reluctantly. Okay, well, thank you for, thank you for that uh, uh, assertion. So, are there any other uh, nominations for uh, commission chair? Oh, come on, surely one of you is dying for all the power. <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a good nomination. I think we should stick with it. And let me tell you just how much power there is. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, let us um, then, um, all in favor of uh, electing this nominee, please raise your hands. And do I get to vote? You do, I don't. I think you can vote for yourself. Well, I'm, I'm abstaining. <laughs> okay. All right, five in favor, one abstention. Is there Is this one with tutorials with you? Beg your pardon? Do I get a tutorial included from you? It depends on what it comes to, but yes. Yeah. I'll bring the wine. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um uh are there nominations for vice chair? Yes. I will self-nominate to save Yay. the trouble. <laughs> yeah, but is there, is there a second? I second it. <laughs> <laughs> <Everybody> second. <laughs> okay. Does the nominee accept the nomination? I accept. Good. So how many other nominations for vice chair are there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, are, are we ready to come to a vote? All right, yes. so all in favor of uh, appointing, electing Robin Fordham as vice chair, raise your hands. It's unanimous. Okay, Ben, I'm trusting you to help um, me through anything. And once, if, I, if I'm called to serve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amazing. Good. Fantastic. I'm now going on leave for six months. Have fun. Okay. <laughs> now, at, at this point, I get to turn the meeting over to Jan. No worry, not yet. Oh, no, we have to do public comment. Maybe people will complain and then I won't be elected. Okay. It's too late. You've been elected. All right. So, um, but I do have an unanticipated item, Ben. So. Okay. So, um, unanticipated. No. What, public what comment. We, public comment. Okay. 
uh, I open the, open the meeting to public comment from anyone in attendance who wishes to make a comment. You would have three minutes to make a comment. And if, if you um, wish to do that and are, and are recognized, please just say your name and address for the record. Okay. <laughs> Hilda Greenbaum. Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road. I have a list that I've been holding up all meeting. I'll start with the last one first, which is I think that the public for which I'm speaking really thought it was going to be a member of commission working with the building inspector that would decide what needs to go forward to the commission. I guess what we're most concerned about is that this bylaw is going to last 10, 15 or more years. We don't know who's going to be staff. Ben knows about historic preservation. I don't know whether we'll have a building inspector or we'll have a planning department in three, four, five years with anybody in, on it who knows what's historical and what's not historical or has a background in, in architecture or whatever because it doesn't necessarily go along with planning or with building inspection. So we are very concerned that things that may or may not be 75 years old may get torn down before anybody knows anything about it. That's the big concern. Okay, and let, that, me, let me comment on that concern just for a second, Hilda. And uh, uh, my comment is that um, we're a commission. We are a group of people with different um, areas of expertise and, and different talents, and our judgments come together as a group. Um, but this we, well, hang on, hang on just a second, please, because um, yeah. I'm not quite done. Um, as you know, from the bylaw that was passed, uh, the commission has the power to um, determine okay. the designee. And if we find that any particular designee is not performing adequately, doesn't have adequate knowledge, is, doesn't have adequate expertise, and is making poor decisions, the commission as a group uh, of citizens uh, will be able to remove that designee and, and uh, appoint another. So that's- um, No, but as long as people know what's gonna be torn down, and my comment along with that, with, with one of the things I think Pat was saying, it used to be in the olden days, and I keep talking about the olden days because the newspaper, the old boat and the old record used to publish weekly the building permits that were issued and the demolition. Per that hasn't happened for a long, long, long time. But that way the public will get to know what's possibly pending to be demolished. That, that, that was, that, and, and I guess, Picking a designee doesn't have to be a member of the commission. I, I gather if you say it can be a staff member, but some people may find that picking a staff member who goes through these applications um, might be a conflict of interest rather than a public citizen. But I just want to raise that. The people will... Oops, we lost you there, Hilda. I got a, I got my list here. Uh, get getting back to the the Hilda, Hilda, the, um, you'll have to limit your time. So okay, I, I will go just, quickly. I will just make the list then. Getting back to form based codes, the only reason it was turned down is because this was a code specific for North Amherst, and the North Amherst residents found it too urban for the historic center of North Amherst. And that I won't go into greater detail, but John Kuhn made photograph, uh, made uh, mock-up drawings that which were at town meeting and we didn't like them. It was much too urban. It looked more like downtown with the five stories high and very dense. So it's not the form-based code we were against. We were against that plan. And I understand uh, from my buddies and the planning board, et cetera, the, we want a uh, style and design review, um, this, whatever you call regulations, and I, I think they're going to be working on that. And then the other thing I'm concerned about is when you talked about CPAP, that 
We've been trying real hard to beautify North Amherst up here. We finally got the town to buy the gas station six years ago, and it will be demolished once the library work is done. But every time I drive by North Church, it looks worse and worse and worse. And it's not, not looking beautiful. And one of the things I'm hoping is somebody might be able to talk to the, the Koreans who now own that church and see if they might be interested in applying for CPAC money to repair the woodwork, which is deteriorating, paint the building so it doesn't look quite so disrupted at all. The, those were the things that, that I had on my mind. We used to have a nice neighborhood going down his Harris and, and, and Fisher Street all connected with, with the church and Harris Street looks like I don't want to say part of the houses are owner occupied with the lawn mowed and the bushes trimmed and half the street looks like foot high grass unmaintained houses mm -hmm. where there have been a lot of student problems. So that's another issue you guys could address in the preservation goals or, or improving neighborhood goals because it is a historic district up here. And I'm, I'm my goal has been to try to beautify and make them better. I think the library is going to do a lot towards that. And 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 if you guys could find a way of talking to the North Church people about maintaining the building and maybe applying to CPAC money, a lot of us would be very grateful. And it's on the agenda for the Neighborhood Association too, because I put it there. All right, those are my comments. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Hilda. And that's why I come to this meeting and write it up every week. So people will be aware that there are these issues out there that some of us aren't happy with. Yeah. But the, the councilors have been working a lot with the Fisher Harris neighborhood about the tenant issues. But the maintenance of the property really is disrupted. Well, I, I haven't been down there all through Corbett and had an occasion to make that little shortcut the other day and I was appalled. Okay, thank, thanks very much for your comments. Um, so we'll go Any to the um, unanticipated items. So um, uh, I wanted to just talk briefly about this property on 65 Taylor Street. Ben, I just got some pictures this afternoon and I sent them to you in, e in an email at the beginning of the me meeting. I don't know if you can grab them. Oh, there we go, yeah. Yeah, um, and then I have a second set for a different barn um, across the street. Um, and I wanted to just, I, I'll try to be brief and I'd like to prepare something a little bit more formal for our next meeting. But in um, meeting with my neighbors and um, talking about this property, I thought it was such a great example of um, the opportunity to develop some sort of proactive structure for using CPA funds for barn preservation. And I know that I had a question to Ben uh, about whether, um, well, just to I'll get, my neighbor wasn't able to attend in public comments today, but um, they're not in a rush at this point, which is good. Um, they were a little bit concerned about some insurance issues, but they're not in a rush for their barn. Um, that is a picture of the barn from the street. So if you were walking by, that would be the public view. Um, they are looking to, uh, that's uh, obviously the front. And then there's one more picture that just um, shows this really, I think she called them king boards, this really wide um, planks on the side of the building. They're interested in um, uh, adapting it for residential use use. The downstairs would be a garage, upstairs would be living space. There's that connection on the side, just sort of, uh, they also want to rehab that area. It used to be living space, but um, my suggestion was that if they were going to pursue CPA funds, they would just focus on the barn. Um, and my thought around, uh, when Jan and I talked yesterday around kind of a general, I'm trying to develop a general framework for what if the, the Historical Commission were to help to develop a barn preservation program would look like. And my ideas were that the first step could be that um, property owners could request CPA administrative funds, if that's allowable for preliminary studies so that they could get a better understanding of the financial implications of pursuing um, 
historically sensitive work um, because that often ends up being more money and to be able to work with a preservation um, a consultant would help to clarify all the issues that are involved in terms of um, abiding by the secretary stand standards and um, the preservation restrictions and um, the nature of the work and how it would change kind of the cost outcome. And then I imagine that from that point on that they would be requesting this preliminary preliminary work, you know, whether it's a structural assessment or um, an architectural assessment, then that would give them the appropriate information that would um, allow them to go forward for a CPA um, proposal. And I wasn't quite sure about funding. I, I, I thought about maybe like a, a matching program um, to encourage people to do adaptive reuse of spaces like that where um, you get the benefit of new, uh, new income to the area and you also save the property. So um, that's just kind of um, my general overview. And I'm gonna try to put something together a little bit more um, professional for our next time where I could kind of map things out a little bit better. But I just wanted to get people's feedback on that kind of overall idea. And part of it is that it would be a program that would both that would be both um, reactive and proactive. So anybody who came to us with a barn that they wanted to demolish would be greeted with uh, the opportunity to take um, and to you know partake in in a plan for barn restoration if they if they so choose. You know the commission could feel better about imposing a delay if there was money for um, stabilization. Um, and that it also could be a proactive move if we, since we have an outbuilding survey now, we could send information maybe on a yearly basis out to homeowners that, that a program like that was available. Oh, and then the final piece being that um, I, the other ideas that I would like to see if the historical commission, and maybe this is a question more for Ben on the town side, if the historical commission could um, submit CPA proposals on a yearly basis, the way that um, the housing trust does to, to fund, um, to, to create a fund essentially, so that this, that this money isn't um, stuck in CPA cycle for any homeowner that uh, property owner that is um, anxious about um, having to get something done with their dilapidated building right away. So those are all the pieces to it. And like I said, I'll try to do something, um, maybe do a little PowerPoint um, and to sketch things out for our next meeting so that we could move forward. But I'd be interested in your comments. And then Ben, if you would just show um, that, uh, that other set of pictures, this was just uh, Josie, um, whose last name I'm forgetting, <laughs> my neighbor. Uh, she introduced me to a gentleman named Ed Wilford across the street on 48 Gray. And he has this beautiful red, um, I guess it was a former, uh, maybe a former um, horse and carriage barn um, that looked to be in, in even better, in much better shape <laughs> than her barn. Um, and, uh, you know, looks like a, fabulous opportunity for, you know, an adaptive reuse of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, you really couldn't, I, I, and, I mean, you know, these, these are the opportunities that are, that are sitting all around. I mean, these are two barns within two minutes by foot of my house, <laughs> so. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm muting myself. I think it's great what you've put together, Robin. I'd love to see a more formal presentation. I think it would be helpful um, to create some kind of process. Yeah. And then I can turn it into an article. <laughs> or you can write it. <laughs> Seems that you know, early on in the Community Preservation Act days, this was a good example of what it was intended to accomplish. And sometimes I, 
I think that <clears throat> sometimes Amherst um, maybe thinks more deeply about housing, open space, recreation, uh, those categories of the Community Preservation Act. Um, so I think uh, an ongoing program um, rather than a series of kind of one-offs would be, um, you know, could make that case that preservation is uh, a continuous activity and not, and not simply reactive. Robin and I talked last night about the idea that if you had a separate advocacy group, it could be um, something that raised funds that was in charge of events that could create an ongoing fund for people to apply towards that we would review applications, but the funds would be there and they could be people who would help spread this idea of preservation to others in town. I mean, they would be sort of not just the organizers of this, but they would also become the mouthpiece of, of preservation for us. So, you know, people who were really interested in preservation, maybe they have a local historic district or they're really involved in it in many ways, or they're just, they have money and they like doing events or they like the social contact, whatever reason, you could get a number of people together and it would be like many other, um, social volunteer organizations, and it would help us um, fight the neglect issue again by putting the word out there about what we do and why preservation is good. So, and it could start with Barnes, but obviously it could go much more universal eventually. I guess I would just, I mean, I'm sure you're thinking about this already, but um, thinking about a program funded through CPA funds, it would be important to kind of calculate in there the administration of the program. Um, and, you know, who actually does administer the program? <clears throat> Since our, our planning department is probably not mm -hmm. expanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I, I would also want to be mindful too. Like, I, I think we, we already have some funds from like 2019 that are for, uh, you know, studies and analyses. And, you know, that that's more to like, um, look at the structural integrity of a, of a building or a barn, um, which that's a much different thing than actually paying for any like actual preservation or, or rehabilitation. Um, Cause when there's construction involved uh, or, you know, actual efforts to preserve the building that, um, you know, adds in the discussion about whether a restriction is required. And, um, and so I, I like the idea of a, um, a, a third party entity, like, uh, you know, Amherst Barnes United or something. Um, <laughs> the Farm Workers United. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that, that entity could both raise m funds privately but then also be a recipient of CPA funds to be used maybe like in, in consultation with the Amherst Historical Commission, but um, not not to have it be because bound, and you were talking about this earlier, Robin, but just not be bound to all the procurement rules and the um, you know issues we face as a as a town to get projects done. Um, right. But, I mean, uh, I think the challenge with that, of course, is like, you know, getting an organization exactly yeah, up the, and running, you know, yeah, like, yeah. To, I mean, it, that would essentially be the, the housing trust model. But, you know, in the meantime, um, you know, this, this, uh, I, I mean, my question to you, Ben, too, is should I, should I direct Josie back to you to explore funding for, you know, they haven't done it any, um, I, she's been in conversation with one architect, I was going to put her in conversation with someone else who I know does um, preservation work within her firm. Right. But, um, you know, the burden for people with these properties is that, um, you know, you have to, if you receive CPA funds, you're, um, you know, you're still under obligation for all those 
you know, requirements. I mean, I don't know that if we if we pass CPA money onto an organization that would we lose the the necessity of you know con, um, conforming with the secretary standards. I mean, wouldn't that you know isn't that kind of a, a mm. requirement of the funds? I mean, you know, that would. I think I think that would still be a requirement. Yeah, and and maybe there's maybe this comes back to our. Um, a conversation we had a few months ago about like when is a restriction required or, right. or, or is there another model we can look to like right right for for grants for like these micro grants i'm imagining like a few thousand dollars potentially or maybe more i'm not sure but maybe there's a a, a point at which a restriction becomes required but otherwise yeah. It's, yeah yeah i mean so in this case like they need they need both they need both pieces <laughs> like they yeah production money if they're going to do a historically sensitive project, you know, they could not do a historically sensitive project or just do it according to, you know, how they feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but the first part would be the studies to establish whether they wanted to pursue CPA funds at all. Yeah. And then, you know, in the beginning, it could just be that. And then we just put them into the regular CPA proposal process, which seems like it could meet off cycle anyway. So um yeah okay well i'll um let me look at the basically i would look at the application that was submitted in 2018 to look at the exact wording of like how that money is supposed to be used i, th I okay. think it's like it's like due diligence and analyses and sur surveys and, and and that kind of stuff so and then i would need permission i would have to run it through the accounting department just to make sure that they think that what we're proposing is the right use of the funds but right, right. Um, there there are a couple of other important stakeholder groups <clears throat> that need to be on board at the beginning and that's the cpa committee yeah. and the town council because either one of those groups can completely reject yeah. what the historical commission advises so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah there it almost I feel like after the debacle we went through last year, it almost, I feel like there needs to be some like, like a, we need to hold like a summit or something or like get, get everyone in the room together to just, because even now I'm like, there's private uh, organizations who are reaching out to me about CPA funds and I'm, you know, it's like hard to know what to tell them. It's like, I, on one hand, certain people in town want these projects funded, but then you know, we've also met resistance. So um, I feel like we just, I need more clarity. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, this could be a, this could be an element of the preservation plan process yeah. because yeah. that plan needs to engage other stakeholder groups. Yeah, exactly. And I also think that it's a lot, a lot of it is actually just the, the, the fund, the, the managing the economics of, of the grant process because when it came up in the discussion I remember one of the town council members described how it might work for Salem Place and I you know just hearing her describe how it could work was really the first time I'd heard it articulated sort of in a public setting and I um, it's not how my mind thinks but it's it's really important if we can grab um people's attention in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and Ben, I mean, the only thing that I was able to kind of discern, I think, from the CPA Coalition website and from other research that I was doing, which is that it's CPA funds, it's allowable that they go to private property owners. Yeah, oh, definitely. But, yeah. but that communities can make their own decisions about those priorities. And mm -hmm. I guess the question is whether that community decision comes from the CPA committee or whether it comes from the town. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, I think that's an important reason for some kind of summit or some kind of needs assessment. And I don't mean needs in interest assessment, you know, like what kind of pool is out there of, home, of homeowners or property owners is out there that would avail themselves of of this kind of program and that's um it, that's really hard to know until 
it's a possibility. Right. And this was <clears throat> the thing that was on Jane's agenda, but not yours, that was going to come under unanticipated, right? Private. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if we need to, mm, maybe as you say, Jane, put it in the preservation plan draft or in some other way, bring it before those two bodies so that we in advance agree on what our goals are, either when they're reviewing our preservation plan or even before they even see it talk to them about this so that we clear this and it doesn't become a thorn every single time this happens because there seem to be cross purposes. On the one hand, there's advertising to get more people. And on the other hand, there's people that don't want it. We need to resolve that before we go a whole lot further, right? Yeah, and I think having, I mean, if we were to do a, a barn or an outbuilding program, because those are such, you know, I mean, it, people have an, in, you know, they may not be able to, but they do have an investment in keeping up their own housing. A lot of people don't have an investment in keeping up an outbuilding. So it's, you know, a nice kind of way to draw a line around a certain um, historical resource here that's one of the most threatened, you know, and um, kind of, you know, keep it limited to that. And then it be, if it becomes a defined program, then there's no question about whether it's the value of the town, right? And then it's just simply that program and we allocate a certain amount of funds to it. Mm. So that, that's, that's a good starting point, I think. Yeah. Maybe Robin, when you put your whole sort of proposal timeline together, maybe one of the first people we should talk to is the CPA committee. Yeah. And then, and then formulate your program and then work it into the historic preservation plan and then talk to the town council once we have CPA behind us, mm -hmm. right? You know, so we kind of come united rather than trying to do everything at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah, Robin, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I think, I think we're onto something here that's important. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, and uh, this is slightly unrelated to the uh, Robin's um, barn proposal, but just in terms of other entities that have reached out to me, um, the the actually Hilda mentioned it, but the North Amherst Church, it, it's the uh, Korean Zion Church. Um, they've e been emailing me. We've been emailing back and forth over, over the past few months. Um, and I think I'm going to meet in person with them next week or in two weeks um, to go over the variety of or, um, scope of work that they're interested in. I still don't, I haven't seen any pictures or um, I've driven by and I see what Hilda pointed out. There's some disrepair, but I'd be curious to know what they really have in mind. Um, and just uh, w luckily, you know, we're at this early stage. I, I would encourage them to get at least two hopefully three quotes for all the different work just to get a good number um, make sure it's someone who has experience with historic preservation so i know what they're doing um and uh but and then the other one is very similar it's actually the south amherst congregational church uh, on the south amherst common uh they have a very specific need which is to uh replace the um it's the bell tower that is uh, needs a lot of work. It's it's original to the building, um, and they're I think they're about to celebrate their three hundredth anniversary. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, it's a very yeah, significant yeah. yeah very significant anniversary coming up. Um, I think in in next year, and they want to. Uh, they're doing a lot of fundraising, but also have a need, see a need for uh, CPA funds as well. Um, so similar. Those bells still ring. That's a really important atmosphere. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. For the South Amherst Common, that the yeah. bells still ring, and it's. I hear yeah. them at my house. Oh, yeah. cool! Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, I, I believe my memory is correct in um, thinking that this is when Jim was on the historical commission that. Um, the North Amherst Church applied for CPA funds and was mm. uh, was rejected. So I think it would be good to look into that history. Okay. That's yeah. when Amherst 
you know, all this stuff was going through town meeting and there were a lot of sort of mixed feelings about CPA funds for private property and religion. Yeah. And religion, yeah. I mean, the, the the argument about separation of church and state for funding repairs to an historic community structure, um, I think, doesn't hold. No, we've had the Unitarian Church window, and we've had the Jewish Center. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we've, and we've awarded we've awarded funds to uh, First Congregational Church, which they didn't we have they didn't use, but. Um, but yeah, I think you know, there's that's a, still a thing that people run into, and I hope there's um in this case. Th there's a there's a Massachusetts Supreme Court case about yeah. this, and it, Robin, you might know more, but I think it's 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 you can't use CPA funds for like religious like artifacts or like a, a cross or a you know something that's been sanctified. I don't I don't know what the word is, but it, if it if it's just structural. Um, yeah, I thought it was related yeah. to the um, not from it can't promote um, it can't promote the mission of the church, but right, but right. You know, structural things are yeah. yeah so the it has to be visible to the general public. Those are right. So I have a yeah, I have a feeling yeah. I'll be reviewing that case carefully. <laughs> in a, but, as, um, as the other thing point. I just wanted to jump in and say quickly is that this also brings to mind this you know a, a need that I would love to be able to try to to fill, which I know is complicated. It's not as easy as just applying and getting money, but that for all of these places, as they come to a super CPA fund, there may be additional uh, funds that they can be applying to as right. well. And, right. and really getting to know those resources and whether or not it's realistic to ask them to apply and to really encourage them to when we think they have a good shot. So I just listened to a uh, Mass preservation, preservation mass uh, presentation by the um, the director of sacred spaces, and I noted one of the things that he said was, they're looking for churches outside of Boston to fund. <laughs> like they want to, you know, they want to get into these more, you know, places like the Goodwin Church and you know maybe the Korean Baptist Church. Um, so, you know that that I, I mean I really want to see that be a part of our interaction with our CPA. Yeah. Actors. And that's why I'd like to see. I think it's great that you're going to meet with them um, uh, to be able to, you know, point them in that direction and see if that 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 allows for CPA funds to go further. Mm -hmm. Because if they get matches from elsewhere, then there are there any other unanticipated items? I have one last one. If that's all you have, Ben. Yep, that's all I have. Okay. Well. well before we pick our next meeting date, I would like to thank Jane for her service oh. as an amazing chair for more years than we can count. Um, and I'm sad to see her go because it's been very fun, but yeah. you've done a wonderful job and we appreciate it. And we have a little gift for you, oh. which I will get to you at some point, <laughs> a little certificate <laughs> to use at Provisions to um, have a happy time. Oh, how how lovely! Thank you, thank you. It's been a real uh, privilege to to have been on this commission for some time and see um, at last <laughs> some things happen. Uh, but uh, you're, you are all a, a terrific group of citizens and volunteers and members who bring uh, a lot of dedication. Uh, and expertise to what you do here and the town of Amherst is, is lucky, lucky that you are its commission. Well, we were lucky to have you lead us to finishing a lot of projects and your expertise is gonna be missed. I'll be calling you, I'm sure, because yeah. you do know through your job, you know, just more about stuff. So you're not totally off the hook yet. Well, I'm around. <laughs> at the end of an email and at the end of a phone line. So <laughs> thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you. Almost you. Thanks. <laughs> I hope I'll be seeing you so yeah. we won't have to miss each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, there's only one motion left, which as I'd like to say is not debatable. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> <But> I think <laughs> next, next pick, day. Next oh yeah, yeah. Day. Sorry, rats. You see, I'm losing. See, it doesn't losing, matter for you. <laughs> losing my marbles now. So yeah. good thing you have a new chair. <laughs> Um, I was going to suggest, so I don't know if you guys remember this from like two years or like a year ago, but we're up against this uh, clock of uh, whether Zoom or in-person meetings are going to be allowed after July 15th. Um, and so all similar to last time, all indications are that at the 11th hour, they're going to pass some legislation to extend it. Um, but so that's on July 15th. I was going to propose maybe we meet July 13th, uh, which is a Wednesday, just so I don't have to deal with. Um, if you remember last time, I like it was like we had decided like two days in advance whether it was going to be in person, and it was really stressful. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Ben. On the 13th, I'm in New York. I'm in okay. New York that week giving presentations. So oh, you're in that. Okay. Yeah, we could do it the week before, or we could do it on yeah, Thursday. Twentieth. Um. So you're in that whole week. You're in New well, York. Well, I'll be back on the fourteenth. So I'm okay. Drive in and boot up. Well, I think it would be over Zoom. If it's um, right. If it's that week, so yeah, I'm available. Yeah, the thirteenth. I have 14th. the right agenda. <laughs> yeah. So, what about like the sixth or the or the seventh even? gives us more time between this meeting and the next meeting but that's before the 15th Mm -hmm. less time between this meeting and next meeting. yeah but less time but more time than if we didn't do that it's before the 15th is better yeah Yeah, i mean i think i'd rather just because that's like two weeks from now so um if any application like that doesn't give time for any application if there are any demolition applications to come in um it doesn't work so i mean i we could do the 14th um which is a thursday if if jan said that worked for her Um, you can be back on the 14th jan yeah i could i could come home and turn around and do this that's okay. so we have to um, speak French at the meeting. Is that okay with everybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, I everybody can do the 14th. Wait, wait. <laughs> I'd rather meet um, the 14th than the 7th. I actually have a conflict on the 7th with something else. Yeah. I think the 14th sounds better from Ben's perspective. Yeah. Time in between, but I can meet on the 14th. I can do the 14th. Okay, well, I'll have to adjust to meet meeting on a Thursday. It's going to throw me off. Let's put it down. But it's just a one off. Yeah. Something, hopefully, yeah. Okay. And you'll, um, before that time, Jane, I need to meet with you and get the preliminary speech and the yada, yada, yadas and all the tips. Okay. And I have to get this to you. That's important. Okay. So. We'll, we'll meet. Okay. So, shall I make a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Anybody want to? Okay. Well, uh, then we're adjourned. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody.